Hello and welcome to Food Composition Explained. My name is Fernanda Grande and in this video I want to show you why learning about food composition databases is so important. So let's start. So the aim of this video is to show you why food composition data are so important. So since a long time ago, McKenzie and Widdowson have already recognized the importance of food composition data for nutrition. They said that a knowledge of the chemical composition of foods is the first essential in dietary treatment of disease or in any quantitative study of human nutrition. So let's see why food composition data is so important in the nutrition field. So here we can see that food composition data is the basis for developing many different activities in nutrition. So for example, we have food labeling and also diet formulation. We also need food composition data to calculate the nutrient intake of an individual or also of the population. And this is the basis for establishing nutrient requirements. They are also very important for research that wants to link the nutrient intake with disease, which are the basis for establishing food-based dietary guidelines, food aid, and also food fortification, especially mandatory fortification. And they are all used as a basis for consumer information. And all these activities are the basis for policies in nutrition, food security, and health. Food composition data is also important for breeding and research, which will result in agricultural policies. So here we can see how food composition data is important for many different activities in nutrition and why they are really important for establishing appropriate policies in different areas. So if food composition data is so important, where can we find it? So we can find it in food composition tables and databases because they provide detailed information regarding the nutrient content of foods. And this information is usually expressed per 100 grams of edible portion of the food. And what are the components that are usually presented? Most of the food composition tables, they include information regarding energy, macro and micronutrients, and sometimes also non-nutrients, such as anti-nutrients. In the past, most of the food composition tables, they were available in printed books, but since quite some time, they are also available on the internet and we can access in many different formats. So here I'm bringing an example of a food composition database. So this is the FAO in Foods Global Food Composition Database for Pulses and this is the simplified database. And what type of information can we find here? So in these first two columns, we can see the food description. So we have the food name in English and we also have the species and subspecies for each of the foods presented here. In the second part, we have the actual co nutrient content of the foods. So here we have the description of the components and also the component identifiers from main foods and they are ex extremely useful and important in food composition tables, but we are going to discuss them in another video. So here we have the basic information in a food composition table and all these nutrient content are expressed per 100 grams of food in edible portion. But sometimes we also have a more detailed information. We can also have a complete database and what we have here in addition to the information that I have already presented. Here we also have summary statistics. So in addition to the average value for each component, we also have the median, the minimum and maximum values, the standard deviation and the number of data points that were used to calculate the average value that is presented in the simplified database. And we also have some extra documentation. We have documentation at food level. So here we have all the references that were used to 
make the average values presented here and we also have some documentation at component level so for example in this case the letter C means that this is a calculated value so energy will always be a calculated value in food composition table and here we have other codes meaning that we can also have some extra documentation for each component presenting on the database so depending on your purpose of using the food composition data this information can be very useful also but when we go to look for food composition data in a food composition database, we need to be aware that many different factors can affect the composition of foods. So let's take corn and as an example. So if I'm looking for data regarding the composition of corn, I need to be aware that, for example, the genetics can affect the composition of corn. So depending on the variety or cultivar used to produce the data that I'm looking for in the food composition table, we can have variations. Also, we have variations related to the quality of data. It means the quality of the food composition table itself. And I'm going to talk more about it in many different videos. But food composition data users should be able to evaluate the quality of the data presented in a food composition table. Another important topic is the food description. So if I'm looking for data of corn, this is not enough. I need to know if I want the composition of raw or cooked corn, if it should be fresh or dried or flour, and the color, if it's white or yellow. So depending on all these details, the composition will change. So this is why the more complete the food description is, the better. But we also have issues related to the component. So depending on the definitions, analytical methods, units and expressions used, we can also find variations. And there are also issues related to the compilation and documentation methods and recipe calculation methods. So all these factors are extremely important when we look for food composition data and we need to take this into account. However, many data users are not aware of this variability and treat food composition values of any source equally, and we cannot do it. When we do it, we may introduce mistakes in our calculations or evaluations and come up with wrong conclusions. And I want now to show you some examples of the problems that we may face when we are not aware of these details. So let's start looking about some problems regarding components and modes of expression. So if I want to know how much vitamin A is there in papaya, a very simple food that we can find in many different food composition tables. So I collected data regarding vitamin A and also the components related to vitamin A in four different food composition databases. So here we have the US food composition database another one from India, this one is from Brazil, and this one is from West Africa. So here we can see that the number of components that are presented related to the total vitamin A varies a lot among the different food composition databases. But let's focus on the three first columns where we have the total vitamin A values. So here, the first thing that we can see is that in the Indian food composition table, we don't have the total vitamin A. We have all the components that contribute to the vitamin A content, but we don't have the total, meaning that the users should calculate this value if they want to use the Indian food composition table. And when we look to the other food composition tables, we can see that the units and denominators vary a lot among them. So the vitamin A values are quite different depending on the definition and unit adopted. So it's extremely important to be aware that different definitions and units exist and also to know how they are calculated and which one is of our interest, so we can select the correct value. 
And just to exemplify how our conclusions can be quite different depending on the definition used, I'm going to show an example of the results when we select retinal activity equivalent or retinal equivalent. So here the authors have used data from household consumption and expenditure surveys from five different countries, here they are identified as countries A, B, C, D and E, to calculate the adequacy ratio per capita for this population using the two different definitions of vitamin A. So here we have the five different countries. Here we can see the adequacy ratio of 100%, so showing that the population meet the uh, estimated average requirement for vitamin A. And in gray, we have the calculations using retinal equivalents. And in red, we have the calculations using the retinal activity equivalent. So we can see that using the first definition, all the countries meet by far the average recommended intake. But when we look at the retinal activity equivalent, three out of the five countries are below the 100% of the recommended intake. Therefore, we can see that our conclusions would be quite different if we look to the adequacy ratio of vitamin A in these five different countries using one or another definition. And this is why it is extremely important that we know which definition we want to use and that we don't mix data when we are evaluating the nutrient intake of a population using different food composition tables. And also, this is why it is important that food composition tables document the type of data presented and that users know how to select the correct data for their calculations. So my next example is regarding the food fortification. Many food composition tables do not contain fortified foods and it will result in huge differences in the estimation of nutritional inadequacy when we don't consider the fortified foods. So I, I'm taking Brazil as an example. Fortification of wheat and corn flours with folic acid has been mandatory in Brazil since 2002. So we have used data from the Food Consumption Survey to show the effect of adjusting the National Food Composition Table for the folic acid content of fortified flours. So here I have calculated the total dietary folate equivalent intake in Brazil using two different food composition tables. So here in the columns where you can see the light green, I have used a national food composition table that was not adjusted to the fortification of flowers in Brazil. And in the dark green, the data set was adjusted for fortified foods. So all products containing fortified flowers were adjusted according to the national regulation. So here we can see that the consumption, of course, when we adjusted the data set, was much higher in all the different regions. So here, when we compare the results with the estimated average requirement, we can see that in the first calculation, when we don't consider fortification, all the regions had an, in, an average intake below the recommendation. But when we make the adjustment for fortification, only one region, the region north, is still have an average intake below the recommendation, showing again that our conclusions will be quite different when we consider or not the mandatory fortification in a certain country. So after all these examples, what are the consequences of using wrong data in our estimations? So if we use a lower value than the actual nutrient content of a food, we will underestimate the nutrient intakes and overestimate the percentage of nutrient inadequacy for a certain uh, component. And we also undervalue nutritious foods. On the other hand, if we use higher nutrient values, we will have the opposite. 
we will overestimate the nutrient intake and underestimate the percentage of nutrient inadequacy. And what happens when we have a lot of missing data? Missing data means that we don't have a value in the food composition table. It doesn't mean that it's zero, but they are usually treated as zero. So these are random errors in the distribution of the nutrient value. And in this case, we will underestimate the nutrient intake and overestimate the, the percentage of nutrient inadequacy. And again, if we don't know how much of a component we have in a food, we will undervalue foods that may, be, uh, that may have a high content of a certain nutrient. And what are the consequences of all these issues with the food composition data? So most probably it will lead us to wrong conclusions regarding the nutrient intake of the population. And what are the results? So here I'm showing the effect of random errors in food composition tables or databases on the nutrient intake distribution. So here in this example, we have the true intake here, represented by this blue line, and we have here an example of an intake calculated with a food composition table or database with random errors. And here what happens, we flatten the curve of intake of this population and in this example it will increase the inadequate intake from 3% to 10% of the population. And what are the consequences for the, this population? So more people are falsely classified as having inadequate intake. The correlations are weakened. And based in these wrong conclusions, we will also have wrongly targeted programs and policies, what means a waste of funds and human resources and no progress in malnutrition rates. So this is why it's extremely important that we know how to select appropriate food composition data. And this is also why it's recommended that food composition tables, they should be country specific, meaning that each country should have its own food composition table. And why? If we saw that all these factors can affect the composition of foods, we know that different countries will have variations regarding the genetics of the foods, so different varieties or cultivars are used, the growing conditions or feed, the composition of the soil and the climate are different, we have different brands, we have different product formulations, also different food policies regarding, for example, food fortification, and these include both mandatory and voluntary fortification, we have different preparation methods and different recipes. So many factors that affect the composition of foods will vary among countries. So this is why it is recommended that each country have its own food composition table. And now you may be thinking, if it's so important, how many countries have their own food composition table? So this is why I'm bringing this slide. So here you can see in darker color all the countries that have already published at least one food composition table or database. So we can see that many countries have already published at least one food composition table or database. But now when we look at all the countries that have already published a food composition table and we have here listed 107 different food composition tables according to the different regions, we can see the distribution of these food composition tables according to the last update. So let's look into the food composition tables updated in the last five years and it corresponds to the blue bars we can see here that only 30 of these 107 food composition tables were updated in the past five years. And I just want to highlight that this graphic was done in 2018, December 2018. So we may have some new updates, but it already gives us an idea of 
how many old food composition tables we have. So when we look at the red bars, we can see that many, many food composition tables were published more than 20 years ago. So even though many countries have already published a food composition table, a great number are not updated since quite some time. So this is why I have created Food Composition Explained. I want to help users to select and use appropriate food composition data. And I also want to help compilers to improve the quality of their national food composition tables and databases. So please consider this channel as a place to exchange experiences. So feel free if you want to send suggestions or make any questions. Thank you and see you in the next video.